talking about a marvelous organ this evening. And before we get into tonight's presenters, they wanted me to go over just a little bit of neuroanatomy in the nervous system. But our topic tonight is unwired when the brain's circuits fail. And if we broke the nervous system down, we can divide it into the central nervous system, which is that part of the nervous system surrounded by bone. Our spinal cord is surrounded by the vertebral column. And our brain, of course, is in this marvelous container, our skull. And then the peripheral nervous system, which is the nervous system that exits the central nervous system. And if you had to take it a step further, you could also talk about the autonomic nervous system, which has two components. And those are the automatic functions of the body that we don't have to think about, thank goodness. For example, the parasympathetic nervous system, which keeps our system functioning at baseline. And then the sympathetic nervous system, which gets us activated in an emergency. It's that old fight or flight response. Now, some of you may not realize this, but if somebody pulls in front of you while you're driving home, your sympathetic nervous system gets activated, right? Your pulse goes up. Your blood pressure goes up. You're ready for danger. You guys, the building blocks, the magic of the nervous system starts with this cell, the neuron. And those cells are what you see is what you get. They are post-mitotic cells, meaning no more. You're, you've, got, you've got what you have, and if you lose them, you lose them. They don't divide anymore. And then surrounding those neurons are the supporting cells of the nervous system, and those are called the glial cells. And you can see them as all these little complicated looking cells. And those cells are still capable of dividing. So if somebody gets a brain tumor, it's not a neuron that's gone awry creating the brain tumor. It's one of those supporting cells that divides. The neurons are exquisitely sensitive to being deprived of oxygen and glucose. They have no stores of energy. They need glucose and oxygen all the time. And four minutes without blood supply, and they start to die, unlike the kidney where we heard our, one of our transplant patients last week who was carrying in a styrofoam box a kidney from a donor, and that wasn't getting any oxygen, and it wasn't getting any glucose, but it was capable of being transplanted into a patient and living fine. Not so, not so with the neurons. And I, we talk about synapses, which is how one neuron connects to another neuron, and I had always, when I was a student, had the impression of one neuron connects with a synapse to another neuron, and that's it. But I like this slide, uh, which would be to your uh, right, because it shows that there are multiple connections between neurons. There are multiple circuits going on. And now our brain. If you thought of the brain, Dr. Dan Graney, our anatomist, reminds us it looks a lot like a boxing glove, don't you think? I mean, really, if you, if you formed it like this, where the fingers go in the glove, that's the frontal lobe. Where the hand behind the fingers goes in the glove, that's the parietal lobe. And where your thumb is, that's the temporal lobe. And then way in the back where your wrist is, that's the occipital lobe. And different areas of the brain have different functions. For example, the frontal lobe is where our personality is largely centered. Our judgment, our reasoning. Hearing, language, comprehension, and memories tend to be focused within the temporal lobe. And our parietal lobe interprets sensation. And the occipital lobe is involved with vision and visual interpretation. And the cerebellum sits underneath the occipital lobe, and that's where our coordination comes from. And then there's a brain stem, which are our core vital functions related to temperature regulation and blood pressure control and heart rate control. It even gets more complicated. Things cross over. So this slide, which I uh, owe courtesy of Dr. Eric Krauss, who's one of our neurologists at the University of Washington Medical Center, it reminds us that a motor activation, so let's say I want to move my right biceps muscle. The information to make that command starts in my left brain. 
and it travels down to my brain stem, it cross over, crosses over, it gets into the peripheral nervous system, it goes out some roots between C5 and C6 of my spinal cord, goes to a nerve called the musculocutaneous nerve that tells my biceps to contract. So things cross over, but some things don't cross over. My cerebellum on my right side, which is involved in coordination, actually helps me coordinate on my right side. So some things cross over, some things don't. It gets kind of complicated. We have two major blood supplies to our brains. And this, there's this marvelous giant artery here, which if each of you fills your Adam's apple and then follows it over into the depression just to the uh, side of uh, the Adam's apple, you'll fill your carotid artery. And that divides into the internal and external carotid artery. And it's the internal that goes right inside to the skull to supply the brain. In addition, uh, I'm going to have it show up back here, there's a vertebral artery that kind of goes in these holes within our vertebral column and supplies the backside of the brain and the brain stem. And they both connect with each other in this marvelous circle uh, called the circle of Willis. You can see though, take a look at this vertebral artery and you can imagine it's right next to bone, it's in little holes in the bone, and if you had a sudden accident in an automobile so that your neck flex forward and back, you could see that that artery could be damaged. And that person could present not only with neck pain, but also with some neurological complaints related to that artery's injury. The last slide I want to show you uh, about, and I hope I'm not going too fast, is from Netter's Internal Medicine. And it shows you how a stroke can take place. So here's a blood vessel magnified. And you can see that there is sclerosis of the artery and a blood clot forms on that roughened internal surface of the artery. And it blocks any blood flow downstream from that artery, and so this tissue dies. And it can't tolerate not having a blood supply for very long. Or another way you could get a blood clot there or to the brain is if it forms somewhere else. So if the blood clot forms right on the vessel and stays there, that's a thrombosis. If the blood clot forms somewhere else, for example, in someone's heart who has atrial fibrillation and they're not anticoagulated and it breaks free from the heart, it also can go upstairs and cause a blockage. And finally, you can even have blood vessels that break open and bleed right into the brain tissue. And if you thought of the brain as kind of a fragile gelatin mold, and then we filled a squirt gun up with blood and squirted it at that mold, you could see that the blood under pressure could actually act like a little knife and cause damage to the neurons. And that is an intracranial hemorrhage. Most strokes are ischemic. Most strokes are caused by a thrombosis or an embolism. But some are caused by bleeding into the brain. So that brings us up to speed so that we can hear from two very gifted doctors. This is Dr. Kira Becker. Dr. Becker has marvelous credentials. She's the co-director of the University of Washington Stroke Center and associate professor of neurology and neurological surgery in the University of Washington School of Medicine. She's board certified not only in neurology, but also in psychiatry. She's authored numerous articles and, and numerous uh, chapters and textbooks. She's acti actively involved with uh, major associations, including the American Academy of Neurology, the International Society of Cerebral Blood Flow and Metabolism, the American Stroke Association, the American Association for the Advancement of Science. She's the president of the Puget Sound Stroke Interest Group, chair of the Professional Education Committee of the American Stroke Association, Operation Stroke, and on the board of directors uh, for Life Center, Stroke Center Northwest. And finally, she received her under, undergraduate degree at Virginia Tech and graduated with the highest of honors. She received her medical degree from Duke University School of Medicine and was a member of the Alpha Omega Alpha Honor Society. She completed internship in internal medicine and residency in neurology at Johns Hopkins. And she went on to do a fellowship in critical care neurology also at Johns Hopkins Hospital. In addition to this, Dr. Becker completed a research fellowship at the National Institutes of Health. Dr. Sylvia Lucas will follow Dr. Becker. She's the founder and director of the Headache Center uh, and neurology director of the Western Multiple Sclerosis Center. She graduated from the University of Washington with a BS in pharmacy, a PhD in neurophysiology from the Department of Physiology and Biophysics, and an MD from the School of Medicine. You, you just couldn't stop yourself, could you? It happens, it happens. <laughs>
She received her neurology training at the New York Hospital Cornell Medical Center and the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and was chief resident in neurology at the New York Hospital. She's a member of the American Academy of Neurology, the American Headache Society, the International Headache Society, and the Consortium of MS Centers. She's the recipient of the Wadsworth Term Clinical Professorship in Headache Research and Practice. Her research interests are in headache and multiple sclerosis, and she currently is on the Medical Advisory Committee of the Washington Chapter of the National Multiple Sclerosis Society and a reviewer for the journals Headache and Cephalgia. So that's Dr. Lucas, and I'm going to get off of this. Would you please welcome Dr. Kira Becker? So the first topic for tonight is stroke, or in keeping with the theme of the evening's presentations, we could refer to it as ischemic unwiring of the brain. I think it's appropriate to start a discussion about stroke by defining what a stroke is. And according to the World Health Organization, stroke is rapidly developing symptoms of brain dysfunction caused by an abnormality of blood vessels supplying the brain, and these symptoms must last for at least 24 hours. So, when you have a stroke and the brain is dysfunctional, what is it really that's dysfunctional? And as Dr. Mengert already alluded to, there are a lot of things in the brain. And the thing that we normally think of if we dissect down the brain is neurons. Neurons are really what give us our ability to function. But those neurons are supported by a lot of other cells. These are astroglia. There's oligodendroglia, which actually provide a sheath around the neurons to make them function better. There are microglia, which are cells of the immune system that live in the brain. And then there are small little blood vessels and all of their supporting cells. So when you have a lack of blood flow to the brain and the brain becomes ischemic, it's not just the neurons that are affected, but all of these other supporting cells as well. So a few facts about stroke. Stroke is common. It occurs in about 700,000 people each year in the United States, which correlates to about one stroke occurring every minute. It's the third leading cause of death in this country behind heart disease, and cancer, and it's the leading cause of adult disability. Someone dies from a stroke about every three to four minutes, and stroke is more deadly in women, as it turns out, than in men, and stroke kills more women than does breast cancer. Dr. Mengard already alluded to the fact that there are different kinds of stroke. Stroke is a very heterogeneous disease. There are hemorrhagic strokes, and there are ischemic strokes, and ischemic strokes are by far and away the most common kinds of strokes. And among the hemorrhagic stroke types, there actually are a couple different kinds as well. There are interparenchymal hemorrhages or intracranial hemorrhages where the bleeding occurs into the substance of the brain. And there are subarachnoid hemorrhages where the bleeding occurs around the brain. You can see the blood here on this CAT scan. So these kinds of stroke subtypes are, are much less common than ischemic stroke. But if you look at the mortality associated with stroke, you can see that intracerebral hemorrhage or interparenchymal hemorrhage is quite deadly. A year after someone suffers intracranial hemorrhage, it's about a 50% chance of death. You can see with subarachnoid hemorrhage, about 30% of people die in the first year. But if they survive, they actually have a pretty good long-term outcome. With ischemic stroke, there's about a 20 to 30% first-year mortality, but then there's a fairly high mortality after that. So while subarachnoid hemorrhage and intracranial hemorrhage are more deadly, ischemic stroke is certainly more common. So the rest of this talk is really going to focus on ischemic stroke. This is a CAT scan with someone with a very large ischemic stroke. And this turns out to be on the left-hand side of their brain. As we look at scans tonight, just want you to realize everything is kind of reversed from the way you think it would be. So this turns out to be the left side of the brain, and this is the right side. So the things that cause ischemic stroke are atherosclerosis. It's about 20% of ischemic stroke. And this occurs due to atherosclerotic buildup or cholesterol plaque in the blood vessels. And here you can see on this angiogram a little bit of narrowing. So this person's at risk for a stroke in the territory fed by that blood vessel. There are embolic strokes. And this is an echocardiogram. And you can see this little mass here in the heart. And this mass can throw off clots and pieces of itself into the brain to cause a stroke. That accounts for about 20% of strokes as well. There's another kind of stroke referred to as small vessel disease or lacunar stroke. And here you can see a small stroke on this scan. This occurs in about 25% of um, strokes. And despite all of our technology in this day and age, there's still a large percentage of strokes, so we never really quite figure out why they happen. Up to maybe a third of them, we're just not sure what the cause was, despite lots of uh, testing. So what are the signs and symptoms of stroke? Well, the big five that the American Heart Association will tell you are that there, um, there is sudden numbness or weakness on the face, arm, or leg, especially on one side of the body. Sudden confusion, trouble speaking, or difficulty understanding speech. 
sudden trouble seeing or one, in one or both eyes, or double vision, which we refer to as diplopia, difficulty walking, dizziness, loss of balance, coordination, vertigo, the sense of spinning is part of that, and then a sudden onset of the worst headache of your life, and that's usually a symptom of subarachnoid hemorrhage. So I'm just going to walk you through some brain scans to show you that the symptoms that you have really depend on what part of the brain is affected. And this is an MRI scan in something called a, a sagittal plane. So it's like you're cutting the head straight down the center like this. You can see the, the nose here um, for sense of reference. And this line tells us where we're cutting the brain. This way, the axial view, to take a look. And again, for reference here, you see the nose and the eyeballs. If you have a stroke that affects this part of the brain, the cerebellum, you get a loss of coordination. If the stroke affects the brain stem, there are a lot of symptoms that can develop, but one prominent one is double vision because the nuclei or the collection of cell bodies that tell your eyes how to move are located here, and they keep the eyes yoked. And if, that, if that's disrupted, the eyes become unpaired and you see double. If you have a stroke that affects the connections between the inner ear, the cerebellum, and the way your eyes move, you can actually get this thing called vertigo, the sense of spinning. If we march up the brain a little bit, and we have a stroke in the left temporal lobe of the brain, we get language problems, difficulty understanding or speaking, and we refer to this as aphasia. If we have a stroke that affects the right side of the brain, higher up in the parietal lobe, you get a symptom that's called neglect, where you might not even realize that your left arm is your own arm. Um, you just wonder what this lump is doing in your lap, because certainly it can't be your own arm. If you have a stroke that affects the occipital lobe, in this case, the left occipital lobe, you lose vision on the right-hand side, if you have a stroke that affects the right occipital lobe, you lose vision on the left-hand side. And if we walk up a little bit higher in the brain and you have a stroke that affects the motor strip on the left-hand side, you get weakness on the right. If it affects the motor strip on the, the right-hand side, you get weakness on the left. If it affects the sensory strip, you get numbness, again, according to the side of the brain that's affected. So with that kind of introduction, we're going to move into a little bit of treatment now for stroke. So I want to ask you guys, I guess it's not a, um, a quiz anymore because you have the answers in front of you. The best way to treat a stroke is to really prevent it. There's nothing that's more effective than preventing a stroke. So the next thing you have to ask yourself, well, what are the risk factors for stroke? How can we prevent it? And you can break down risk factors into non-modifiable risk factors, those that you can't do anything about, and modifiable risk factors. So let's start with the non-modifiable risk factors. Age is the most important. The older you get, the more likely you are to have a stroke. And the risk of stroke doubles with each successive decade of life after the age of 55. It's not to say that strokes don't happen in young people. In fact, about a third of all strokes do happen in young people, but the major risk factor is aging. Race ethnicity. Your race and ethnicity determine the kinds of strokes you might have. Asians are more likely to have intracranial hemorrhages. African Americans more likely have intracranial atherosclerosis. Caucasians more likely have extracranial atherosclerosis. Um, so all of those things play into the kind of stroke. And it turns out that most races other than Caucasian have a higher risk of stroke than Caucasian. So, so not being Caucasian in and of itself has a, a greater risk factor for stroke. And then gender plays a role. At any given age, men are more likely to have a stroke than women, kind of like heart disease, with one notable exception and that is subarachnoid hemorrhage. Women are more likely to have a subarachnoid hemorrhage than men. Because age is such a strong risk factor for stroke, and because women live far longer than men, the bulk of strokes in our country are occurring in women, because there are a lot of older women alive that have strokes. Men have already died of the heart disease. If we look at modifiable risk factors, um, you can see that there are several, and this is just a, a partial list, but by far and away the most important of these is hypertension. That's why I've put it in large fonts. The population attributable risk of hypertension for stroke is 50%. That means that half of all strokes can be attributed to poorly controlled blood pressure. If there's nothing else that your doctor does to prevent a stroke, just controlling your blood pressure is, is, is enough. Nothing else will affect your risk more than having your blood pressure controlled. Other risk factors for stroke include diabetes, smoking, high cholesterol or hyperlipidemia, this abnormal heart rhythm called atrial fibrillation that Dr. Mengert referred to earlier, and excessive alcohol consumption. So how do you prevent a stroke? Well, firstly, of course, you don't smoke. Exercise is really important, and eating well. Kind of sounds like the mantra for, for life. Of course, you need to lower your blood pressure, and it turns out really effective ways of doing that are to exercise and to eat well. <laughs> and you need to lower your cholesterol if it's high, and it turns out that the ways to do that are to exercise and eat well. So 
it's pretty clear how, how one needs to live to lower their, their risk of having a stroke. Well, what happens if you're leading the straight and narrow path and you still have a stroke? As Dr. Megard said, maybe you're rear-ended in a, in a car wreck, you have this hyperextension injury, you damage your retrieval artery because it's going up there through the bones, and you have a stroke because of that, and you show up at the hospital. What are the treatments that are available? Well, the major treatment that we have available for stroke this, these days is something called tissue plasminogen activator, TPA. Aspirin is also a treatment for stroke, and we'll talk about these. So if we assume that a stroke is due to a blood clot that blocks an artery, it seems like the most reasonable thing to do would be to restore blood flow to that artery. And the way to do that is to dissolve the blood clot. And this is what TPA, which is called a thrombolytic, does. A blood clot is made up of red blood cells, fibrin, and platelets. And what a thrombolytic does is actually dissolves the fibrin to dis dissolve the blood clot. And a little over 15 years ago now, the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke, branch of the NIH, funded a trial to see if you give patients who have an acute stroke an intravenous injection of TPA soon after arrival of their stroke, will that improve outcome? And what they did is they took patients, a little over 600 patients, and randomized them to receive placebo or TPA within three hours of stroke onset. Then three months later, they did neurologic assessments to see how these people were doing. And this complicated graphic shows you the outcome. I'm not going to go through all of this, but just to sh show you that everything on the left-hand side of this graphic means patients did better. Everything on the right-hand side means they did worse. And if you look here at this particular scale called the modified Rankin scale, a score of 0 or 1 means that you've returned to normal or almost normal. You can see at three months, patients treated with TPA, 39% of them had returned to normal or almost normal, compared to 26% of patients treated with placebo. So that's an absolute benefit of 13%. Pretty remarkable benefit. And to summarize the results of that study, we can say that if you receive TPA within three hours after presenting with a stroke, it'll increase your chance of surviving without disability. It doesn't decrease your chance of dying from your stroke, but from surviving without disability. Patients treated with TPA are about 50% more likely to return to normal following stroke than patients not treated with TPA. And if you kind of do the numbers, it means that for every seven patients you treat with TPA, you're actually going to improve outcome in one. So it's a pretty effective medication. Unfortunately, because it needs to be given so early after stroke onset, very few patients actually um, end up getting TPA. The estimates in our nation are that less than 5% of people actually get this medication just because they're not getting to the hospital in time. And to kind of illustrate more the effect of time on, on outcome from stroke when you're treated with TPA, I'm going to show you this complicated graphic. It's not so complicated, so I'm going to walk you through it. On the x-axis here, you have time from stroke onset to treatment with TPA. And on the y-axis, you have the odds ratio for a very favorable outcome, so the odds of returning to normal. This blue line is essentially the line of unity. And anything above that suggests that TPA is better than placebo. Anything below that, placebo is better than TPA. So for patients who receive their injection of TPA within an hour after stroke onset, they're about four times more likely to return to normal than patients who received placebo. By the time two hours had passed, that benefit was down to about two and a half times that of placebo. And by the time you get to three hours, there's essentially no benefit left to getting this drug. So every minute counts. This is just an example of that. This is a, a young gentleman who came in about 40 minutes after experiencing the onset of a left hemiplegia. That means he's unable to move the left side of his body. And on the CT scan, you can see a blood clot sitting here in the right middle cerebral artery. So this patient got an injection of IV TPA, and his follow-up MRI scan shows you some patchy strokes in the territory that fed by that blood vessel. But contrast that to a patient who came in about eight hours after stroke onset. You see this very large stroke that that res resulted because this patient was not eligible to get TPA because the ischemia and the damage was too far along. As Dr. Mengert said, the brain only can last a very short period of time without getting blood, oxygen, and nutrients. So after three hours, the chance of salvaging tissue in the brain is pretty limited. What about aspirin? Um, a couple large studies have been done to show that if you take an aspirin after an acute stroke, it'll actually increase your chances of, of having a fairly good outcome, or more appropriately stated, it'll prevent you from dying or becoming disabled. So not nearly as effective as TPA because it's not 
returning you to normal. This is just preventing you from dying or becoming severely disabled. And it's not as effective because you need to treat 100 patients to, to improve outcome in one, compared to TPA where you only need to treat seven patients. The caveat is that the timing for aspirin is quite wide. You can give aspirin up to 24 hours or so after stroke onset and still potentially get a benefit. So aspirin is a very useful drug following stroke. It's just not nearly as effective as TPA. Because most patients don't come into the hospital within three hours, again, very few of them receive TPA, so what are the other options besides aspirin? The thing that's done probably most commonly now in the community is something called endovascular therapy. And that's therapy not injected through a vein, but actually through the vessel that's affected in the stroke. And this is an angiogram, and you can see a blood clot here affecting blood flow. So this is contrast material that goes up and stops because there's a blood clot sitting there. After an injection of TPA directly into the blood clot, you can see that blood flow has been restored to this patient. Um, and this is uh, the basal artery. It feeds the brain stem. And this patient actually had a very good neurologic outcome because they were treated within about an hour after arrival, their stroke. Another potential treatment is something called mechanical thrombectomy. And this is a fairly new approach to treating stroke. Um, the risk of giving a thrombolytic like TPA, because it dissolves blood clots, is it can also cause bleeding. And so the bleeding risk is not insignificant, but the benefits of the drug far outweigh that risk. This approach, using a me mechanical clot removal, does not give a drug that dissolves blood clots, so the risk of bleeding um, is much less. And this device actually has a little corkscrew on it. And, and what's done here is this corkscrew is passed through the clot in the blood vessel, opened up, and it pulls the clot out, just like it would pull out the cork of your wine bottle. So pretty effective for opening up a blood vessel. There's still a, a little bit of question about the, the effectiveness at later time points, which is being worked out. But these are all potential therapies that one could receive for stroke uh, in the community. What should you do if you're having a stroke? By all means, call 911. If you end up calling your primary care physician first, that wastes valuable time. Every minute counts, and the data shows that if you arrive to the emergency room by an ambulance as opposed to a family car, you're going to get seen a lot faster and treated a lot faster. So if you think it's a stroke, you call 911. When you come to the hospital with a stroke, not only will you get treatment for that initial stroke, but you're going to get some kind of treatment to help prevent a recurrent stroke because recurrent strokes are quite common. You can see that 14% of people who have a stroke or a TIA, a transient ischemic attack, which we'll talk about in a moment, are going to have another stroke within one year's period of time. And about 22% of people, 25% of people who have a stroke will die within a year's period of time. So how do you prevent that next stroke from occurring? How do you prevent someone from dying? Well, it really depends on what caused that initial stroke. And the key when someone gets admitted to the hospital with a stroke is to go through a very systematic review of all the possibilities that, that could have caused that stroke, because each potential possibility may require a different treatment to prevent the next stroke. TIA is something I mentioned um, in the last slide, and I just want to spend a little bit more time on because I think it's so important. TIA stands for transient ischemic attack. Some people refer to this as a mini stroke. It's more appropriately referred to as a temporary stroke. It's like a stroke that begins to happen, but within about five or 10 minutes, all the symptoms resolve. Um, the official definition means that the symptoms should resolve in less than 24 hours, but in reality, most symptoms will resolve in about 10 or 15 minutes. Because the symptoms resolve, a lot of people say, well, gosh, I'll just call my doctor tomorrow and you know, see what happened, or you know, I'll make a clinic appointment next week, which is absolutely the wrong thing to do. Because if you present with a TIA, according to this particular study you can see, the risk of a stroke within three months is about 10%. And half of those strokes that occur, occur in the first 48 hours after the TIA. So if you suffer a TIA, it's like you have had a stroke. You need to get to the emergency room immediately to see what caused it, to see how you can prevent that stroke from occurring. And again, the highest risk period is immediately after that TIA. So TIA, in my mind, is equivalent to a stroke and requires the same kind of workup. There's a very abbreviated uh, period of time to talk to you about stroke tonight. Um, if you want to learn more about it, we have a great website with a lot of information on it, so I'll direct you to that. And um, I think at the intermission and at the end, we'll be able to take uh, questions. Thank you.
Good evening, everyone. It is not intuitive why people get headache. Uh, in fact, um, we still don't know why people get headache. If you think about it, um, it's not really pain, although headaches are painful, but pain sometimes has a purpose. If you put your finger on a hot stove, you pull it away, avoiding further problems. If you have a toothache, you go to your dentist, try to avoid infection or an abscess. But a headache certainly isn't mechanical failure like a knee. It's not heart failure, uh, which might uh, be a pump failure. It's not electrical. So what is it? And uh, again, I think we don't know the purpose of headaches. They certainly have been conserved in time. Um, however, in this case, it might be a symptom of the brain circuitry working too well. There's about 186 different types of headaches, and I'm not going to be talking about all of them. But the two that you might be most familiar with and that people are most likely to go to a physician about are tension headaches and migraines. And tension headaches um, occur in about 96% of the population. People have had at least one. It's great if you haven't had a headache. But tension headaches are really the ones that are low grade. They do not have a significant impact on your ability to do things. It wouldn't prevent you from doing something you wanted. They tend to be mild to moderate, and they're usually bilateral, like someone put a vice or a pressure around your head. Typically, there's no nausea or vomiting with them, and there might be some a light sensitivity or um, uh, photophobia. Migraines, however, another, are a different story, and at one point were one of the top three disabling conditions in the world, as um, suggested by the World Health Organization. These headaches are moderate to severe, and they usually last anywhere from four hours to three days. Um, they're often one-sided, but not always, and some people, not many, will have aura, and aura can be described for most people as some twinkly lights that you might see in your field of vision, last about 20 minutes to an hour, but resolve, usually followed by the headache. Also, migraines can be made worse by routine activity, so many people want to go to bed and stay there with the lights out to prevent the light sensitivity, the sound sensitivity, and the nausea and vomiting that many people will have. Let's talk about prevalence, because this is interesting as well. If you look at Americans, within one year, um, about half of the population will have a tension-type headache. Fewer will have migraines. About 18% of women and 6% of men in this country will have migraine. A far lower percentage, but still 4 to 5% of the population, has headaches almost every day, so greater than 15 days a month. And of course, these are the patients we see in the headache clinic. Now, for those of you unlucky to have never experienced a migraine, let me take you through what a migraine might be like. Um, the phases of a headache are shown in this slide. About 50% of people, if they were going to really think about the events leading to a migraine, will describe a typical uh, prodrome or premonitory symptoms. And this can be many different things. It's very individual for people. They might notice that they're not sleeping right, or they have a funny sensation in their head, or they're yawning a lot, or they have certain food cravings. In fact, Chocolate, which has been shown as a bad guy for causing migraines, may just be carbohydrate cravings the day before, and then you just link it with having the headaches. About 18 to 20 percent of people have aura. Again, I talked about that as twinkly lights, but some people can get numbness or even weakness on one side of the body. And after that, the headache usually comes, although aura sometimes is not followed by pain. Now, people can have pain either rapidly, which we call a crash migraine, or slowly, and it can take several hours to develop to peak pain. And then after that, there's a, what we call a postdrome. Um, many people will call it a hangover-type pain, and some people actually do have headaches with their hangovers, I'm sure, but um, different mechanism. Um, I'd like to show you this slide. Um, this is a chalk drawing um, drawn by one of my patients a few years ago who uh, allowed me to use this. Um, she tried to describe what it was like for her to have a headache. 
And as you can guess, if you were guess uh, uh, which side is uh, affected here, it's certainly her left side. She did have a left unilateral headache with most of the pain really uh, in the eye. You can see that she drew um, sharp pins that were stabbing her in the eye. She had a knife that went from the, from, the, from the eye all the way back to the back of her head and down the spine. It was severe pain. She described it as jabbing, stabbing, knife-like. She also had nausea and vomiting. And everything hurt. Now, this is unusual. This is not pain. But her scalp was sensitive. She couldn't put a comb through it. Light hurt. Sound hurt. She had to be in a dark room, kids out of the house, even turning her head to look to the other side of the room was painful. She had to stay in bed, and it lasted 24 hours. Before treatment, she missed an average of about two days of work a month. And indeed, if a migraineur has moderate to severe headache that's untreated, they can miss an average of about 2.2 work days um, each month. I think this is interesting as well as far as who gets headaches. This shows the age and gender of migraine. You can see right off the bat that women are affected, again, three times as often as men, but only in a particular age range. And it, as it turns out, boys get headaches sooner than girls, about age eight. That's a peak incidence. But as soon as a girl has her menstrual period, goes through puberty, boom, it's different. So. Um, the peak prevalence for girls is between about ages 25 and 44, and then in the menopausal years, we start decreasing the prevalence of headaches. So you might think, yeah, this sounds terribly hormonal, and indeed it is. So one of the triggers for women uh, can be hormones, or more than that, um, the withdrawal of estrogen. Um, 55 women in this slide um, kept a diary during their menstrual cycles of when they got their migraines. And as you can see from here, um, the peak migraine frequency was really uh, the first day that their menstrual period started. It doesn't mean that they didn't have headaches at other times of the month, but they always had headaches at the time of their menstrual period. And in fact, 60% of women migraineurs are closely linked with headaches either happening two days before to three days the, uh, after the onset of their menstrual periods, called menstrual-associated migraine. There are other female reproductive events also that can influence migraine. We talked about menarche. That's the peak incidence of migraine in girls at the time they get their period. Um, their menstrual-associated migraines, thought to be linked to the decrease in estrogen that we see a day or two before the onset of the period. Oral contraceptives may or may not make headaches worse. It's certainly better now that the estrogen levels are a lot lower in the pill. Uh, pregnancy is usually a great time, and most of my migraine patients say that they would like to have 20 children because during uh, the, their pregnancy, their estrogen levels are nice and high and stable, no headaches. Um, perimenopause, usually a bad time because of um, up and down levels of estrogen. But menopause, when you're through, you're done, you're better. Hor hormone replacement therapy it may, all, may or may not um, affect headaches as well. So what causes headache? Well, like many other things that you've heard about in many medical school, um, it's environment based on some sort of genetic risk. Environment may be internal and external triggers that I'll talk about, but the genetics is really quite interesting. Most people will come in to me and say, you know, I've done everything I can not to have these headaches, but then you ask them, is there anybody in your family that has it? And it's usually, yeah, mom, aunt, grandmother. So somebody in the family has headaches. A headache brain is inherited, and what we inherit is a transmission problem, hyperexcitability, hypersensitivity. If one parent has migraine, the chances are 50% uh, that a child will get it. If both parents have migraine, 75%. What are the triggers? Well, here we are with diet and exercise again. But typically, you know, it's really good for a migraine patient to be boring, just as boring as you can be. You eat the same time, you don't skip meals, you get enough sleep, um, can't do much about the hormonal changes, but at least they're predictable. Um, environmental factors are sometimes triggers, especially in Seattle. Barometric pressure drops, I have people lining up uh, to get injections for their bad headaches. Could be altitude, could be flying, 
um, too much exercise, and stress and anxiety uh, is another issue. We all have stress and anxiety in our lives, but it's not that it's different, it's how our internal bodies um, handle it. Again, migraine is a transmission problem, and um, though I don't want to go into these genetic abnormalities that are associated with headache, the interesting thing that this slide um, hopefully shows you is that there may be different genetic causes for um, headache. Uh, there is a type of headache called familial hemiplegic migraine. These patients have an aura of weakness on one side of their body that is followed by the headache. The headaches all look the same. Patients have the same kind of headache. But interestingly, when you look at large family cohorts, 60 or more people, for example, in a family with migraine, and it's tough work getting these folks, um, at least in uh, familial hemiplegia type 1, as shown up here, the problem is on chromosome 19. Exactly the same headache, different family, FHM type 2, the problem is on chromosome 1. The third family, it's on chromosome 2. So again, there's a lot more than meets the eye to the underlying reasons for people to get migraine. But we're fi finding the genetic abnormality now, even in people uh, without aura. Uh, another clue to the fact that you don't inherit migraine, but you inherit a certain type of brain that can have migraine, is the comorbidities of migraine. Comorbidity is just something that will happen a lot more often if you have a certain condition than another condition. If someone has migraine, then the odds of having depression, anxiety, phobia, bipolar disorder, irritable bowel syndrome, and insomnia or other sleep disorders is about two to five times the rate in migraineurs than in those who don't have migraine. So what does this tell us? Well, it tells us you inherit a package. Your brain is working a certain way, and the risk is to have not all these, but at least the risk of having some uh, or one of these at least. And what do, these, uh, what do these conditions have in common? Well, we think the neurotransmitter that mediates these is serotonin. So perhaps if we work on serotonin or alter serotonin uh, in some way that we can help migraineurs. And I'll talk about that uh, a, a little bit later. Well, let's talk about the pain. Uh, you know, then you have this brain that is susceptible to getting migraines, so what next? Well, um, several years ago, uh, Hans Diener's group in Germany uh, in 1995 looked at 13 migraineurs. These patients all had right-sided migraine. This could only be done in Germany because um, these people selflessly remained untreated with very severe headaches, uh, enough to go into a PET scanner. And PET scans typically take, you know, four to six hours. So um, they were very brave being in there uh, suffering with their headaches. Now, a PET scan will show you where blood flow goes in the brain, depending on what part of the brain is active. And what you can see here are a couple of areas that had increased uh, blood flow in the brain. One was this area right here, to the left side of the brain stem, uh, in an area close to the periaqueductal gray. Now that happens to be a midline structure in the brain that is really important in pain pathways. There were also actually three other areas in the brain that increased the blood flow. You can only see one on this slide. One is here in the anterior cingulate cortex. We think that's important in pain perception. And there were two others. Um, one was in visual and the other was in auditory association cortex that we thought was associated associated with people having light sensitivity and sound sensitivity. Now, these pulled these people out of the PET scans, gave them sumatriptan, or imitrex, that is a migraine-specific drug that takes care of migraine, waited till all their symptoms went away. No headache, no light sensitivity, no sound sensitivity. Then they put them back in for another four hours and found that the areas having to do with pain perception, sound and light sensitivity, completely normalized. What stayed, however, was this area here, what we think is the migraine generator or modulator in the uh, brain stem. Um, it is also close to an area called the trigeminal nucleus caudalis that we also think is a big player in the onset of migraine. So 
What this shows us is maybe the headache will start uh, or be modulated in the brain. However, most of you know that the brain is insensate. It doesn't have pain receptors. This slide is after a wolf, and this work is probably at least 65 years old. But he did some very interesting neurosurgical um, uh, uh, procedures that actually showed us what structures are pain sensitive in our brain. Typically, they're around our blood vessels, small and larger fibers, um, sinuses, sagittal sinuses. Um, and the lining of the brain, um, the, called the meninges, and we have the dura, we have the arachnoid, the pia, um, this is chock full of nerves and blood vessels. And we think this is actually where the pain of a headache takes place. And in fact, um, you can think of a headache as being referred pain. So you have a heart attack, and maybe your left arm hurts. In the brain, um, what is, what is activated in the trigeminal nucleus, which is the mother nucleus for the trigeminal nerves, which innervate not only the lining around the brain, but our scalp and our face. Um, any of those that gets activated can actually cause pain. So it's a referred pain problem. So people can feel their headaches anywhere those nerves innervate. Typically, it's going to be over the eye, the, the frontal area, or the temples. Um, and again, these are different branches of the nerve, the ophthalmic or V1 of the trigeminal nerve, the maxillary V2, or the mandibular V3. However, the trigeminal nucleus also gets input from the neck and the shoulders. So people can also feel their headache in the back of the uh, head or in the neck or the shoulders, although there it may be a tightening or a squeezing. So we've got the trigeminal pathway, um, the trigeminal nucleus in the back of the brain. And you can think of that as taking in a lot of input from whatever's going on in your life. Oh, you had a glass of wine last night, you had five hours of sleep, you stayed up too late studying, it's two days before your period, boom, light switch goes on for a headache. So what happens then? Well, chances are that you know here in the trigeminal nucleus, the light switch goes on, and it activates the trigeminal nerves that innervate the meninges, the lining of the brain. That's where the headache happens. Once you stimulate these nerves and the light switch goes on, then what happens is you release very inflammatory proteins. We call these neuropeptides. Calcitonin gene-related peptides, substance P, neurokinin A, these are really nasty players. And in fact, calcitonin gene-related peptide is probably the most vasodilatory, inflammatory substance we have. When that migrates over to the blood vessels of your brain, they just get big. They spill protein, they spill kinins, they spill everything. It's an inflammation. And you have no susceptors or pain fibers that actually take that signal back through the same trigeminal neuron. And these neurons go both ways. And then through the trigeminal nucleus caudalis, uh, back up the thalamus and um, into the cortex. And um, I'm just going to see if this will work. It's a, a, a Hollywood version supplied by GSK of um, these responses activate meningeal pain, pain receptors called nociceptors, which then transmit the signals to the trigeminal ganglion and centrally to the trigeminal nucleus caudalis, TNC. From the TNC, the signals travel to higher brain centers, including the thalamus and cerebral cortex. When the signal reaches the cerebral cortex, the patient first experiences the sensation of pain. I was alluding to migraine as sometimes being followed by pain, but migraine is more than pain. Um, some of the other things that happen besides aura that can be neurologic and pain is effects on the gastrointestinal system. The gut gets very still. We call that gastroparesis. Sometimes there's autonomic symptoms. We're used to people having nausea and vomiting with headache, but you can have nasal congestion, tearing, a red eye, um, and also the tightness uh, of the musculoskeletal system, uh, mood problems, difficulty in concentration, so big time cognitive issues as well. And why is this? Well, um, showing this uh, 
a cartoon of a brain stem, it gives us a hint of what might be going on. Besides the trigeminal nucleus caudalis that is responsible for the pain, both incoming uh, uh, afferent input and also outgoing trigeminal um, uh, output, also what seems to be co-activated is the green nucleus here, the nucleus tractus solitarius. We think that is really important in causing the nausea and vomiting. And just medial to that is the dorsal vagal nucleus, which is important in the gastric stasis that we see uh, in some patients. So migraine more than pain. Treatment, how do we, what do we do? We have this genetic abnormality that causes migraine that's not curable. So what we can do is th are three things. One is we try to identify triggers for people, and if they can control their triggers, um, try to control their triggers. Lifestyle modifications, we can recommend it. It's up to the patient. Um, sometimes the triggers are predictable, like uh, taking a tablet to prevent a migraine when you walk in an airplane door, if flying is what triggers, uh, triggers your migraine. Um, acute treatment is typically what most people want from their physicians. You have a headache, you need to take a pill for it, and we've got some very specific uh, drugs for that. And in people who have many uh, days of migraine, sometimes taking a preventative or a daily drug to decrease frequency and intensity of migraines is warranted. Um, what do we have for migraine medications? Well, we have several different things. I, do, I like to divide them in terms of specific therapy and nonspecific therapy. Specific therapy actually stops the migraine. These drugs are truly designer drugs. They are designed to bind to the trigeminal afferent end point where there's a serotonin receptor and stop the release of these nasty neuropeptides. There are two classes of medicines that do that. Triptans that I'll talk about in a little bit and a much older uh, group of drugs, the ergotamines and dihydroergotamine. Nonspecific drugs don't stop the migraine. You can go over the counter and buy aspirin, Tylenol, Excedrin. Um, you can get prescriptions for opiates, Tylenol with codeine, Vicodin. These don't stop the migraine, but they may make you feel less pain while the migraine merrily goes along and you wait for it to end. There's also adjunctive therapies. If people have nausea and vomiting, it would be nice to have some medication in the refrigerator like composine suppositories that would stop uh, vomiting because that's the single biggest reason that people will go to the emergency room. Can't keep anything down, can't keep fluids down, have to go in and get a shot. So this is the same um, graph that you saw before with the exception that I want to use it now to talk about the targets. The triptans were truly designer drugs. Um, a patient was given a drug called serotonin. It's a neurotransmitter. It's nasty if you give the whole drug, but the person's migraine went away. So you take this drug and then fine tune it so that it only acts on certain serotonin receptors that are associated with headache. That was done in the late 80s by a scientist at uh, what was then Burroughs Welcome. And uh, we came up with drugs called the triptans. That's their class name. Now, the triptans act in three places. One is right here. Um, they act at serotonin type 1 D receptors, and they keep the nasty neuropeptides from being released. The second place they act is right inside the blood vessels, serotonin 1 type B, and they shrink that swollen meningeal artery so they vasoconstrict it. The third place they act is here at the trigeminal nucleus, probably interfering with the pain pathway. There are seven triptans now. You may have seen these advertised in magazines or television. Sumatriptan, or Imitrex, was the oldest introduced in the United States in 1993, the most recent being Elitriptan or Relpax. They're the same category, different side chains. Some people do better on one than another. The dihydroergotamine drugs come in a nasal spray and an injectable. They are not uh, stable orally, unfortunately, but also quite effective. Frequent headache, well, the bad news is there's no cure. The good news is it's probably the only thing you're going to hear about tonight that gets better with aging. Um, 
Chronic daily headaches, however, are found in about 4 to 5 percent of the population. And as I said before, sometimes these people need to be on preventives. It's tough. They may work on some people, not others. And I do have people come in and say, I feel like a guinea pig. Well, I think this gets back now to the genotype of this headache. I think as we get closer into figuring out who has what genetic abnormality that's underlying their headaches, we're going to be able to do better as far as treating. So if people get more than about six days of headache a month, if they're very disabled with their headaches, or if they're using uh, Excedrin or the triptans or anything more than two, day, two to three days a week on average, you need preventative medication. Or if you can't use the triptan medications, and you can't if you have heart problems or risk factors for stroke, then uh, the preventatives are indicated. And my last slide is just showing all the preventative medications that we use. And as you can see, there's a category of antidepressants, of medications you use in the heart, medications we use for epilepsy, um, medications we use um, for anti-inflammatories, and also others such as Botox, which actually is good for headache but not approved by the FDA as of yet. Things like feverfew and magnesium and um, other things that are as yet experimental. They all have two things in common. They either decrease brain hyperexcitability or they modulate the serotonin 5-HT1 receptors important in headache. Thank you.